It's said that a picture is worth a thousand words. In some cases, it can be worth even more. Before serving as director for the Global Mission Center for East Asian Religions in the 1990s, Clifton Maberly had served a number of years in Thailand as a missionary. He noticed that people were drawn to storytelling through pictures. I was in a village one day with Pastor Mun Lansi, and he said to me, have you ever seen the painting of the last life of the Buddha? And I said, no. He said, every temple has one. And he knew the abbot from that temple. So he went to him and said, can you show this foreigner your picture of the last life of the Buddha? So he came and brought it out and rolled it out. It was 50 meters long. But what was most interesting to me is when we rolled it out, the children who had come to look at me, they suddenly forgot about me and they went and got their friends and they told each other the story from the long picture that was on the grass. For some time, Clifton had been brainstorming ways to make the gospel message relatable to the Thai people. I already knew that painting was the main means of memory of stories in temples. Paintings are never worshipped here. People never pray to them. We're not in danger of idolatry. But people's way of reminding themselves of their own stories was paintings. Clifton wanted to commission paintings to tell the story of Jesus. He visited the Fine Art University, and one of the painting teachers recommended Clifton talk to his mentor and teacher. So I went to the teacher's college, found him, and said to him, I got a strange thing here. I want to tell a story that hasn't been told in Thailand before, but I want to do it through Thai art, not because it has to, but because it may speak to heart better and it also will be a talking point uh, rather than bring in art from somewhere else. The accomplished Thai artist agreed. For several weeks, they strategized how to best communicate the story Clifton wanted to tell. They decided to start with a scene depicting Jesus' second coming, a scene that had never been created in the Thai Lana art style often seen in temples across the country. The painting was there being slowly formed in the heart of their home. And there was a big pile of books and spirit prophecy books and books he borrowed from the library there. That was the main thing that was in his lounge room for maybe 10 months while he did the first painting. Every time I visited him, it was there. And I thought, would I put so much effort into telling somebody else's gospel as he put in telling my gospel? After months of laboring over the painting, it was finally finished and placed in the Chiang Mai Adventist Church, located in the culturally rich and historic city center. So this is the picture of the second coming of Christ. Now, um, we have portrayed the second coming of Christ many different ways, but there is a description in Revelation of the rider on the white horse with his following horses as a picture of the second coming. So he's taken that one literally and made this the rival of the rider on the white horse. So all of that is in this picture, this, this struggle between the rescue from light of the people who almost die in darkness but are taken off and the world is left desolate behind it. So this is the first painting that he painted. The Chiang Mai community was very interested in the paintings and would visit the Adventist church to come see them. People came every day to look at the paintings. Teachers would organize even from primary school, from secondary school, from the teacher's college, from the university. They came to get introduced to the pictures, to see the picture as a class project. And Buddhist monks came to the door and said, we heard you have some paintings, can you open the church for us to see them? And so I never had any negative reaction from any of those people, they were all willing to listen to the story from beginning to end, which I can't just bring people from the street and say, let me tell you what Adventists believe about the end of the world. No one's going to sit and listen. But with a painting, they just listen like lambs and ask many questions about it. Seem to just open them up to curiosity in a way that talking will never do. By contextualizing the gospel for the people of Northern Thailand, Clifton and the Thai painter open doors that may have never opened otherwise. They offered the opportunity for people to see a message of hope that most of them would not have listened to if it had not been painted. 
Now, over 35 years later, these paintings are displayed in the Library of Asia Pacific International University, where many of the students are from a Buddhist background, and where the climate control can preserve these paintings for future generations to see. Please pray for the people of Thailand and throughout the 1040 window, where the majority of people aren't Christian. Despite having different worldviews, using creative means like these create opportunities for connection. What about mission in your community? Are there ways you can contextualize the Adventist message to those around you? Well, we just had prayer, and uh, Pathfinders were part of that prayer, but I want to do something a little special. Um, our Pathfinder Club, uh, every single one of our uh, uh, young members are going to Gillette, Wyoming, which is quite a ways away. And uh, some of them, in fact, a couple, uh, are going to be leaving this week. The others flying out on Sunday, I believe. Pathfinders, and everyone who's going to Gillette, come up. I want to have a special prayer for you uh, before uh, we begin today's service. So come on up. Anyone who's going to Gillette, come on up. And with Pathfinders in mind, I wore something uh, I, I don't normally wear today. My happy face pin. All right. Okay. We're and some of our pathfinders aren't able to be here today. Is Max going to make it up? Yep. There, you <laughs> there she comes. All right. Well, I guess you can. You can all. You can. You can join your your family over there. Um, and so we have. Uh, about one, two, three, three or four other Pathfinders that aren't here uh, today, weren't able to be here, but um, I'm wondering, those of you who are driving, uh, Conrad and Max, have you figured out how far it is from here to there? Uh, yes. But you can't remember? I can't remember. <laughs> it's right on the oh, it's on the screen. It says... 26 hours, 1,799 miles. But if you take off anywhere, it's going to be over 1,800 miles. Quite a ways, uh, a long drive. And the rest of you are flying. You're going to where? Where are you going? To Denver. Denver. Have you been to Denver before? Yes. You have? One of the nice things about the Denver airport is they don't have to come down as low as they do here to land the airplane. They've made their airport a mile up into the sky. Did you know that? Am I, am I telling the truth? Okay. Of course, the dirt rises that high, so it's a mile high. But see, they don't have to come all the way down to sea level. Anyway, so I uh, want to pray a special prayer for God's blessings upon you and your travels and your experience there. Shall we pray together? Lord Jesus, thank you for the exciting and wonderful world that you've made. And for each of the Pathfinders, their families, the Pathfinder staff that comes together and explores uh, nature, explores all kind of things that can lead us into a closer walk with you. So I pray for safety in all the miles traveled by this club and, and all of the others, between 55 and 60,000 people showing up. Keep everyone safe in their flights. And I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit is felt by everyone there as the goal is not just to get together and say, hey, we're all pathfinders, but to say we're finding the path from here to eternity that you're leading us on, Lord Jesus. May your spirit touch every heart 
bring our club back safely to us, and we look forward to their report and a message on a future Sabbath of what it was all about, what they experienced, how they grew together seeing the world church and how they grew together in their commitment of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So just over a week from now, Gillette, Wyoming is going to become one of the most populated cities in Wyoming. And I've looked at the maps online of how much space is going to be there to camp for these 60,000 people showing up. I hope you like close quarters. <laughs> so, but I'm told, I believe, what, uh, uh, 110 square feet? 110 square feet per person dedicated to the camp area. Per person. So... So we have an area that's not quite as, well, half the size of this for our Pathfinders to camp. That's comfortable. That's comfortable. Yep. Uh, when we go camping, Pathfinders, we know we always like a whole lot bigger space than that. But uh, that's going to be fun. Well, I invite you to pray with me one more time before we turn our attention to the Word of God. Father, we Again, pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit touching our hearts today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to this world, being born, living your life, demonstrating what a life of commitment to the Father is. We want to be like you, Jesus. Come into our heart. Amen. Today, as we gather in worship, we accept what Jesus offered and established as an ongoing reminder of his sacrifice for our salvation. And as we accept it, it is with our full hearts of saying, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. We call the holy service that we are going to uh, participate in today uh, the communion service. Sometimes it's called the Lord's Supper or the breaking of bread, holy communion. Jesus established this sacred memorial himself, at the final meal that he ate with his disciples just before he was arrested and crucified. Uh, within less than 24 hours of, the, of this meal, Jesus was dead on the cross. Uh, they had gathered together for a special meal. It, it was the Passover meal. The Passover had been begun over a thousand years before. And it was a time of memory of the rescue of the children of Israel from slavery, the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And so what happened was, as they gathered for this Passover meal, Jesus infused two items of that meal with a new significance tied to him and his death. When the Passover was, when people gathered for the Passover and the Passover meal every year, there was a set menu that everyone had on their plate, on their table. Um, on their plates, among other things, the things I want to specifically look at is that there was the lamb, there was unleavened bread, not just normal bread, but unleavened bread, meaning it didn't have anything in it to allow it time to rise. And there was grape juice called wine. In fact, in the Bible, any time they refer to grape juice or fermented wine, is all wine. It's the same thing. Uh, it's kind of when I grew up, then, uh, and I've said this in here before, so some of you have heard the story, of my experience growing up, we might be traveling somewhere and we would stop to get gas and my dad would say, uh, uh, do any of you want a Coke? And us kids would say, yeah, I want an orange one. I want a root beer. I want, they were all Cokes. Seven Up was Coke. 
Pepsi was Coke. Sorry, Pepsi. <laughs> it was all Coke. And uh, that's just the way we grew up. Uh, we have phrases that they're all called nowadays soda or what's another thing that they're all? Pop. In the, in the West, it's pop. Here, it's soda. In Louisiana, it was Coke. <laughs> so, uh, and I don't know if it still is. But um, so it is with the um, grape juice, everything. It was called wine. The wine of the vine. <laughs> Except they didn't use the term wine. They used oinos. Um, anyway, um, when they gathered together, they remembered the hardship of slavery. They remembered the plagues of Egypt. But I've gone to uh, Passover meals uh, with uh, Messianic Jews at their um, places of worship in the past. And they've told me, expect a happy, excited time. This is a party. This is a party remembering freedom from slavery. And among that, they remembered that the angel of death that took the firstborn of all of Egypt, passed over the home of every house that was covered with the blood of the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb. The Bible tells us that as they met together, Matthew 26, 26 says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he began to give thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. How long has it been since Jesus had grape juice? Almost 2,000 years. Jesus now connected the bread and the cup with his body that was soon to be broken, crucified, nailed to the cross, and with his blood, which was soon to be shed. The Passover meal was a foundational meal of the covenant promise of salvation when covered by the blood of the Lamb. And as I said, Jesus is the Lamb. The communion service is the foundational meal of the renewed covenant, the covenant made new, the fulfillment of all that was prophesied. Jesus himself, God on earth, giving his life in our place that we might live. Shortly we'll share together accepting what Jesus designated, representing his body, representing his blood. We'll share together and pass out the, uh, the unleavened bread, the unfermented grape juice, representing his body and his blood, untainted by sin. But first I want to focus on something that happened before Jesus made this transition from focus on the symbolic lamb of God to himself and the fulfillment of the promise. The story is recorded in the Gospel of John. And from this story comes the title of today's message, Invitation Not Extended. Someone was not invited to the upper room that night. Did you know that? With God, there are no oversights. Somebody was missing. Listen to what happened. John 13, starting at verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. <laughs> no, said Peter, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, I like Peter, don't you? <laughs> Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean though not every one of you. 
for he knew who was going to betray him, and that, and that was why he said, not every one of you is clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verily, very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. As I said before, with God there's no oversights. All that is needed for our salvation is provided or is made ready or we are led by God to situations where we say, I've got a decision to make and Jesus, I choose you. Yet on the evening that Jesus and his disciples celebrated the, Pas celebrated the Passover and they ate the symbolic meal together, someone was missing and it caused quite a problem. Or did it? I knew Jerry Thomas. I uh, talked to him on several occasions. Uh, he's the writer of the book Messiah. And I want to share with you um, from one of the chapters talking about this. I was really sad not long ago to hear that uh, Jerry had passed away. But listen, I'm going to read four pages. And because we're celebrating the communion service today, Right after I read this, a few comments, and then we will continue with the service of the communion. Jesus met with his disciples to share the Passover feast. He knew that his time had come. He was the true lamb, and on this Passover, he would be sacrificed. He had only a few quiet hours left to teach his disciples. Throughout his ministry, Jesus had lived a life of unselfish service. But his disciples still had not learned the lesson. On this night, he was quiet and troubled. The disciples could tell that something was weighing on his mind as they gathered around the table. He said, I wanted very much to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. I will not eat another Passover meal until it is given its true meaning in the kingdom of God. Jesus lifted a cup of grape juice, give, gave thanks to his father, and said, Take this cup and share it among yourselves. I will not drink from it again, from this fruit of the vine, until God's kingdom comes. The shadow of the cross had fallen over Jesus, and its pain was torturing his heart. He knew his friends would desert him. He knew he would be put to death in a most humiliating, painful way. Those he had come to save would respond with, cruelty. For many, his sacrifice would be wasted. Knowing this, he would have been, knowing this, he should have been overwhelmed at the thought of his own suffering, but care for his disciples was his chief concern. On this last evening, Jesus had much to tell them, but as he looked into their eyes, he said nothing. They weren't ready to hear what he had to say. As the silent moments passed, they shifted uncomfortably, shooting jealous glances at one another. And if you read the full account in the other Gospels, then you'll find where these uh, thoughts are coming from that he writes down. Once again, they were arguing over who would be the most powerful and important in the new kingdom. The disciples li liked to do that. James and John's request for the highest offices still rankled the others and threatened to cause a real split among them. Judas was the harshest critic of the two brothers. Judas had forced his way to the left side of Jesus as they entered the room. John had taken the right side. Whatever the most important office would be in the new kingdom, Judas was determined to have it. All this led to another crisis. It was the custom at the meal like this for a servant to come in and wash the feet of the guest. Who was missing? The servant was missing. A pitcher of water, a pan, and a towel had been provided with 
with the room, but there was no servant. With their teacher present, it fell to the disciples to offer the service. But they sat silently, each one refusing to be seen as a servant doing this humble job. They were arguing over who was going to be the greatest. Not a one of them was going to take the humble position of being a servant. How could Jesus make them understand that claiming to be disciples did not make them true followers? How could he awaken the love in their hearts that would make them understand his words? How could he save them from Satan's temptations? For a time, Jesus waited to see what they would do. Then he stood, took off his cloak, and picked up the towel. In shocked silence, the disciples could only watch as he poured water into the pan. One by one, Jesus began to wash their feet and wipe them dry with the towel. This opened their eyes, and with bitter shame, they realized how they had been behaving. This example Jesus gave was something they would never forget. His love for them was so strong that he was willing to lay aside his royal holiness and be their servant. Judas had already agreed to betray Jesus to the priest, although the disciples knew nothing about it. Jesus knew, but he didn't expose Judas's plan. When the Savior's hands were washing his feet and tenderly wiping them, Judas almost confessed his plan. But in the end, his pride was too strong. He couldn't admit that he was wrong, and he hardened his heart against ever repenting. As his heart hardened, Judas became offended that Jesus would wash his disciples' feet. Anyone who would do this, he said to himself, could not be Israel's true king. Satisfied that he would gain nothing by following Jesus, he felt sure that betraying him was the right thing to do. Under the influence of demons, Judas was determined to go ahead with his plan. Judas had tried to place himself first by sitting at Jesus' left side, and Jesus had served him first. This left John for the last. But like Peter, John was ashamed of himself and didn't feel slighted. When Peter's turn came, he still couldn't believe what Jesus was doing. Lord, are you really going to wash my feet? Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you'll understand it later. Peter couldn't, un couldn't stand to see his Lord, the Son of God, acting as a servant. Filled with shame, his whole heart rose up against this humiliation for Jesus. And he cried, you'll never wash my feet. If I don't wash your feet, Jesus said, you're not one of my people. Well, that was something Peter could not accept. Lord, then don't just wash my feet, but my hands, my, my hands and my head also. Jesus must have smiled at Peter's enthusiasm. A person who is bathed needs only to have their feet washed to be clean. But Jesus was speaking of more than just being washed. Peter and the others had been forgiven, washed clean of sin when they accepted Jesus as their Savior, when they'd been baptized, right? But having been led into sinful jealousy, they still needed Jesus' cleansing grace. They needed to repent and be forgiven again. Jesus wanted to wash the jealousy and pride out of their hearts. Without, without an attitude of humility and love, they were not ready to share the memorial service Jesus was about to create. But by washing their feet, Jesus created this change. He didn't just wash their feet, did he? He washed their hearts. Except for Judas, their hearts were united with love for each other, and each one was ready for someone else to have the most important position. Now they were ready to listen and learn. We also have been washed clean by sin by accepting Jesus and his sacrifice for us, but often we find our hearts dirtied by sin. We need to be washed again by Jesus' grace. Our temper, our anger, our pride cause him pain like the disciples did. But we must come to Jesus because only he can wash us and make us clean again. When Jesus finished washing their feet, he said, Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash each other's feet. A servant is not greater than his master. Knowing the selfishness that lives in the human heart, Jesus set this example of humility and selflessness. Jesus, equal with God, ruler of the universe, 
bent down to wash the feet of those who followed him. He washed the feet of the one who had already agreed to betray him. God does not live for himself. He lives for others. Jesus came as a human and lived as an example of that. He reached out to help every person with whom he came in contact. He lived the law of God and showed us how to obey it. Jesus told his disciples, I did this as an example so that you should do the same. With these words, he began a religious service, a ceremony that should be repeated by his disciples to help them remember the lesson of humility and service. And so today, that's what we do. And it may be new to some that before we pass out the bread and the juice, we actually give opportunity to wash each other's feet, symbolically cleansing, humbly saying, I'm here to serve. And when we do this, then we typically will pray with the person that we wash their feet, and then they'll wash our feet, and then we come back here and we gather for the emblems that are on the table now of the grape juice and the bread. And so everyone is invited to participate. If you would rather just wait here, music will be playing uh, softly, and uh, you can wait for the others to join. But we're going to divide up into two different locations, in uh, the mother's room and in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, ladies who would like to serve one another, then you may do so. And if you have any questions, then uh, there'll be uh, someone there to answer your question about what to do or just watch and see what's happening. Uh, men, uh, downstairs at the far end of the uh, sanctuary, not the sanctuary, it's below the sanctuary, the fellowship hall, then uh, there's um, a bucket of water that you can dip uh, and get a towel and wash each other's feet. Couples that would like to serve one another uh, in the closer end by the, uh, by the serving table then that's where we will be. So we will go and serve one another. And then when we come back, would you do me a favor? If you sit on the back row, either you're, you got here early enough to get that one. The next row, don't sit on that row. Move up a row. The next row, don't sit on that one. Move up a row. Leave an empty row between each one of you so that those passing out the emblems can get through. Okay? Well, let me pray with you, and then we will go to this service, and it'll take about 10 minutes, and we'll be back. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you initiated that evening, this, this service that reminds us that you gave your all, 100%. Though innocent, you were crucified, and your body was broken. Though innocent, you were whipped, you were beaten, you were stabbed. Your blood flowed. You were nailed to the cross. And Father, I've prayed to you before and told you, I'm not worthy. Don't waste your blood on me. And I remember what you said to my heart at that time. It's too late. I already shed my blood. Don't let it go to waste, Lord Jesus. May not a single drop of your blood go to waste on any one of us. We accept you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.